I have an I'm Cyril Stover. Well, we're starting off at this time tonight, and uh, this was just so we could conclude that special program on activities of the wife of the president. Welcome. Now, the cases of xenophobic attacks on Nigerians in South Africa have been of concern. In the year 2015, it was reported that many Nigerians were killed in the attacks with property worth about 84 million naira either looted or destroyed and without compensation. And the reoccurrence two years down the line, analysts say, must stop as it contravenes the provisions of diplomatic relations between Nigeria and South Africa, which center on the protection of their citizens and their well-being, security of life and property, the economy and social development, as well as sharing interests at the international level. Now, citizens attribute hate speeches, racism, media bias, poverty, and ignorance as some of the root causes of the xenophobic attacks, especially on Nigerians. Now, what's the way out? And many Nigerians, of course, would ask the question and say, have South Africans forgotten so soon the role Nigeria played in the struggle against apartheid? And how much is Nigeria really gaining from South Africa? And these are some of the questions we'll be raising tonight. But first, let's get to see this report by Gabriel Odu. A strong or pathological fear or hatred of strangers or foreigners is considered xenophobia. This hatred or fear has continued to occur in South Africa year after year. What then is responsible? Fellow South Africans, we need each other. Let us not kill each other. There is no country in Africa that can survive in isolation. Not even the USA can survive in isolation. We need each other, South Africans. Let us not kill fellow Africans. Honorable we Malema, are one your thing. Time has expired. Africa is one. We must refuse the artificial borders imposed on us Malema, by colonizers which have led to the division of Africa. Africa, we are one. That is Jilos Malema, leader of the Economic Freedom Fighter Party on last year's xenophobic attacks on foreigners. Take us back to our country's map is going to get better because we end up dying here. I think South Africa is a bad country because they are killing us for no reason. Those people who are going to make money, they can have poor, that's why they think like that. But they don't know how we work, how we work the hard, how we make money, they don't know. That's why they want to steal. I said foreigners must go back to their countries. They start beating us, rooting our shop, taking our belongings. And we had no power. We have to call the police. And when the police came, they were not able to control the situation. Even the former Ghanaian president, John Mahama, has this to say. That the young people of South Africa do not know what happened before they gained their freedom. The whole of Africa stood behind South Africa. Those seems all pleas and appeals are falling on deaf ears as another xenophobic uprising hits again. Nigeria, on her part, has called on South Africa to march words with actions. The federal government urges the South African government to bring perpetrators of these deplorable acts of violence to justice. Meanwhile, the South African government has continued to give assurance of the safety of Nigerians and other nationals. Despite this, we cannot afford the luxury of walking away from each other. Now, more than ever before, we need each other. And of course, we will try our best to make sure that we normalize our situation, that our people, those who come from South Africa and are in, in Nigeria, come to live peacefully. Nigeria and South Africa share common economic and historical backgrounds as former British colonies and enjoy excellent bilateral relations. It could be recalled that Nigeria was at the forefront of the decolonization process of Southern Africa and the dismantling of apartheid in South Africa. Well, that report sets the tone for tonight's discussion. Uh, let me uh, introduce our guests here. We're here tonight with uh, Ambassador Shola Enikonulai, who is the Permanent Secretary the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Sir. 
We're also joined tonight by the Honorable Abika W. Arewa, Senior Special Assistant to the President on Foreign Affairs and the Diaspora. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Cyril. Good evening. Right. We had extended an invitation to the South African High Commission, and uh, we wrote to them officially to invite the High Commissioner to come on this program. Well, as you can see, um, the South African High Commission is not represented, but we had invited them and we officially wrote to the High Commission to send in representation on this program. Also tonight, we expect to be joined later on by uh, the Chair of the House of Representatives Committee on the Diaspora. But first, let me, as usual, acquaint you with the procedure of this program. At the appropriate time, you can get to be part of the discussion in the studio. You can join in. The various uh, platforms will be on your screens. You can take advantage of that. And as we always say every Tuesday, for those who will be phoning in, the numbers will be on your screen. And when your call gets through, when it's passed at the appropriate time, do us a favor, just reduce the volume of your TV set. That way we'll avoid the hurlback or the echo. And the best way to know your call has been passed through is you'll see your name appear on screen. Once that happens, it means that your call has been passed through to the studio. Just go ahead with your question or comment. Don't waste too much time and don't even bother about any greetings. Uh, you know how erratic the phone lines can be. Just go straight on. Once your name appears on screen, it means your call has been passed through. Just go right ahead with your question or comment. And I guess we'll be willing to take on such issues as you might raise. So once again, welcome to NTA Tuesday Live. Let's begin by discussing this all-important matter, the xenophobic attacks on Nigerians in South Africa. And let's uh, start off by turning to the Permanent Secretary in the uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry, Ambassador Shola Enikonlai. Many Nigerians and everyone virtually uh, has, 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 has described this as one attack too many. It's been recurring. And what is responsible for this? Well, um, thank you, Cyril, and good evening, Nigerians. Um, I agree with you that this is one attack to many because it has become a recurrent uh, decima. In our assessments, a number of uh, remote and immediate causes are responsible, in our view, for these uh, spate of attacks. First, we have to look at post-apartheid South Africa, including even the social economic conditions and the political landscape of, of, of uh, South Africa under apartheid, and the kind of uh, premise of a better life, of black empowerment that was expected post-apartheid, unfortunately, has not taken place. And when you now used to pose that with the kind of social economic conditions that are currently prevalent in South Africa as the middle parts of Africa, uh, the conditions for that kind of frustration already exists. And then you have, uh, as it were, um, foreigners, quote and unquote, and I like to characterize the attacks as Afrophobia rather than xenophobia, because most of those who have been attacked are largely Africans, including Nigerians. We have no record yet of non-Africans that indeed have suffered from this attack. And then when well, you now have pockets of uh, prosperity, among uh, foreigners, in this case, other Africans, including Nigerians, particularly in the townships, there's that kind of uh, resentment also amongst the, the, the local population. And then there's also the fear that uh, migrants, even though statistics do not be added out, start, uh, foreigners have come to take over, as it were, some of the economic opportunities and jobs that uh, you know they thought directly belonged to them and not to foreigners. And finally, as we speak, even though this current attack predates, I mean, uh, you know, predates development that we find in other parts of the world, including the rise of populism in some countries in Europe and also the United States, there's a general anti-immigration feeling and trends that we have seen occurring in many parts of the world. We don't want to think we don't think this is part of what's going on in South Africa, but as a contest also, especially in recent time, we find these uh, kind of feelings. So within all of these, they uh, may be responsible. Of course, uh, uh, you know, statements have been made that there are issues of crime, there are issues of, of uh, drug trafficking, and, uh, you know, all sorts of crime. But our view is simply that, I mean, if people commit crimes 
against the laws of the land. Please treat them in accordance with the law. Get them arrested, get them prosecuted, and, uh, and convicted. The solution is not to kill them. It's not to, it's not to harass them. It's not to destroy our property. So those are some of the immediate and remote causes that, in our view, had been responsible for these uh, attacks. Uh, oh, thank you. All right, thanks so much. We'll, we'll return to you. But uh, um, uh, let's talk to the senior special assistant to the president on foreign affairs and the diaspora. And, um, well, you, you know a lot about this because um, I recall that, um, really? yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that your attention had been drawn to this a long time, even when yeah. you used to be a member of the House of Representatives. Yes, um, thank you very much, and thank you, Permanent Secretary. I use the same words you use. I call it Afrophobia, because <laughs> it's actually about Africans, mm. South Africans being against their fellow Africans. Well, like we heard, this is the seventh xenophobic attack in South Africa. The last one before this, you recall, was March and April 2015. Um, yeah, yes. And that one was actually triggered by the Zulu king, who made some inflammatory statement. This particular one, I'll say from apparently it's been triggered by politicians. It's now a campaign tool in South Africa. Drive away those black criminals and your lives will be better. Drive away those criminals and you're going to get out of economic woes and all that. And I'm glad with what President Zuma said and also former President Thabo Mbeki that driving away immigrants is not going to solve the problems. It can even actually make it worse. And I also believe that it has continued to occur because up till today, at least taking it from 2015, nothing has happened to those who allegedly um, committed these crimes against their fellow blacks. Up till today, no compensation has been paid to at least the Nigerians that were affected in previous xenophobic attacks. So South Africa itself, number one, has to call out those politicians that are making it a tool of politics. I mean, the world is going through hell. We all are going through hard times, generally speaking. And uh, we can understand we want to fight crime. That is fine. Fight crime, but not legitimate Africans doing. And we're talking of Africans that are doing businesses like tailoring, mm -hmm. restaurant. You saw the Nigerian guy whose mechanic workshop was destroyed, mm -hmm. about 18 cars belonging to South Africans. You know, these are people doing not big businesses. The, Niger the barber. There's a particular barber that you see on the streets of Johannesburg. He has a shop there. I mean, when it, everybody wants him to have their hair cut. So, you know, these are people doing small, legitimate businesses. Yes, the criminals are there. The drug uh, people are there. And there was a time they complained that they even take the houses that belong to them. You know, so they should be angry at their own authorities, not that people doing legitimate businesses. But, you know, if nothing has happened in the past, then it's going to continue to happen. And uh, for the first time, Nigeria, there were no reprisal attacks. This is the first time that, and again, this is the first time it's happening under this administration, and I believe that it will be tackled headlong. But uh, for the first time, you had reprisal attacks. And I think today, I've been on a flight, but today there were demonstrations at the South African um, embassy in Lagos. And there are probably a few more of such um, reprisals from some Nigerians. So basically, South Africa has to show the political will to sincerely want to deal with this issue of Afrophobia and not just pay lip service to it. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, even countries driving away immigrants, you just might not be better off, off for it. So if you have issues with crime, I mean, you know, yesterday, 97 uh, Nigerians were deported from South Africa. Yeah. Eight were drug-related. And we can, we can come to that, that, that later, but oh. that will be just my take for now. Okay, but, well, uh, uh, Ambassador, uh, Nigerians are asking, is it that, uh, the South African government is powerless to do anything about it. That's on, on the one hand. Because uh, it's happened before and um, we haven't seen any action taken by the South Africa, African authorities to, to, to address the situation. Now it's happening again and the feeling is that the South African government is not just doing anything. That's on the one hand. And the other is at what level of engagement? What's the level of engagement between the authorities in Nigeria and South Africa over this issue? Yeah, um, thank you, Siri, for that very important comment. Let me start with the last point. Uh, in terms of uh, the level of engagement and institutional mechanism and framework for engagement, we have a binational commission with South Africa, one of the very first countries 
with whom we had this uh, arrangement after Algeria. And it has the clusters, uh, areas of collaboration and cooperation. One of the decisions taken of recent is to elevate the status of that binational commission, which hitherto held uh, at the level of vice president to that of the president. So we believe with this decision, we'll be operating at a level in which the president will supervise and give directives on their, under their command as to what should happen, including matters of immigration. That, that is already happening. At our own level, we continue to engage South Africa at the level, at the level of permanent secretary. We have a forum of consultation between the, the officials of both countries. Uh, that we need to react to. But the truth of the matter is, some of these mechanisms have been largely moribund. Uh, we need now to reactivate them and be sure that they, 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 they operate to, 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 to the highest level so that we can tackle this uh, challenge head on. I agree that these attacks have uh, continued to occur. The time is long past that we must now engage South Africa. And then it's the, like the first point you raised about uh, the, the commitment of South African government. I cannot speak for South African government. It's a pity that the High Commissioner is not here. But what I do know is that uh, I think the commitment is there. Perhaps there are issues around how this is uh, to be executed in terms of hey, I can't tackling this. Head on. There are dynamics in South African politics, dynamics uh, within the presidency and indeed the parliament, and uh, we have to take all of those into consideration. But however, our national interest is key, and I want to assure Nigerians that on this occasion, we are determined to engage. And one of the things the uh, government has decided to do is to dispatch, as a matter of urgency, a high level delegation to a composite delegation to South Africa. We intend to engage at the highest level to be sure that uh, th these attacks do not occur. Because uh, finally, we cannot uh, continue to ignore, we are aware of the mood out there among Nigerians that we need to do more to be sure that these attacks do not occur. I think uh, this government is committed to doing just that. Thank you. Well, Eve, just today at, uh, at the Nigerian Senate, uh, the, the Senate decided to also send uh, a team to engage with uh, the South African legislature on this. Uh, Nigerians are very angry out Absolutely. there. They're yeah. angry and, well, some Nigerians are calling for, you know, more drastic action uh, by this administration to tackle the issue because, uh, in fact, they're saying it's not just South Africa. It seems that everywhere Nigerians go, people just take advantage of, uh, of them and do things and, and get away with it. How do you think this can, uh, I mean, this can be nipped in the bud? Well, I also agree that more drastic actions need to be taken. And as you've heard the permanent secretary say, they are raising this discussion to the level of president to president. So I think starting with that, uh, we'll, we're going to see some action. But I agree with you that some uh, drastic action needs to be taken. Yeah, the Senate has done what they need to do, also engage at the parliamentary level and um, ensure that even the parliament intervenes. But um, South Africa has been making some moves in the past that mm, hasn't quite been helpful. Take, for instance, the issue of the voluntary. I think they have what they call the voluntary work permit, mm. which they give to Africans, Nigerians, Ghanaians, former Africans. They withdrew that some time ago, not under this administration. They, they withdrew the voluntary work permit, which means that that um, mechanic, the, the pe person running a restaurant, they make it difficult to get a work permit. So if you don't have a work permit, they call you an illegal immigrant. Again, if, if they're going to be serious about these things, that is one of the things they need to do. Return the voluntary work permits. You know, to let, let genuine people have these work permits. Now they are raiding various communities in South Africa. As that, um, even today, they went to raid some communities. If you don't have that work permit, they're going to send you back. So that, it, that, that is part of a political will. You know, there are people doing their genuine businesses. They've made it difficult. We have them in Nigeria, too, and we give them work permits. They work as um, uh, domestic workers. But you have to ensure that they get the work permit. But South Africa has deliberately made it much more difficult and has made life harder for Africans in South Africa. And again, let South Africa also understand that it, it's one of the challenges of leadership. You know, South Africa is a leader in Africa. So is Nigeria. So it's one of the challenges of leadership. But with this happening under this administration, I believe that as we've heard the permanent secretary say, the ministry really has to take a more drastic action. 
All right, the phone lines are already open. We have uh, calling in from Aquaibom, Emmanuel. Hello, Emmanuel, go ahead. Hello. Hello, good evening. Good evening. Please, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, please, can you hear me from we there? We can hear you, we can hear you. Go ahead. All right, good evening. Um, I have concerning the issue of xenophobia. And phobia. <laughs> Okay, concerning the issue of xenophobia, I try to check on the documentary, try to see um, the issue, how it is happening. And I realized that um, the Nigerian government really needs to emphasize more, especially to the South African government. You know, we are Africans. If we continue this way, we will not be united. And, um, you know, if you remember during the time of the Africa, then um, Nigerians, Stood out well, we fought hard because we are brothers. We try to protect each other. Now, if a thing like this is happening, you can see there is no unity among us, and it can lead to um, break up of trust between the African nations. So, please, I will urge the Nigerian government to stress it more on the South African government. Let them know the need for Africans to unite. And as well, I think. Um, those who are carrying out this act are somehow brainwashed because if they are not brainwashed, they should be able to know and realize that we Africans need to stand together as united. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Well, like you said there, um, Nigeria's role in the dark days of apartheid, and uh, in fact, so many Nigerians record, including Nigerian students, had to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you put in so much, is this what you paid back with? Uh, um, uh, thank you, Suri, and thank you, the caller from Akoibom State. Um, we agree that, indeed, um, there's a need for greater awareness about our contribution, the contribution of our country to the anti-apartheid struggle, not just in South Africa, but the entire Southern African region. We realize that there's not enough knowledge and awareness about the contribution that we've made. You, you mentioned the role of students. I also recall that even as a young civil servant, there was a South African relief fund, uh, you know, from which your, I mean, your salary, a percentage was deducted monthly from source. And then I don't need to mention other contribution in terms of material, in terms of, uh, you know, support for the liberation struggle, in Russia, where the Liberation Committee was domiciled, you know, all sort of material, financial, uh, you know, short of actual military support for this liberation struggle. So we believe we need to encourage South Africans to raise awareness about this role. Let me quickly also seize this opportunity, which I should have done at the beginning, to show government empathy for all Nigerians who have been aff affected in this particular uh, uh, crisis those who lost, uh, you know, property, and those who are injured is in this entire government uh, empathizes with you, and uh, we, our, our minds, our, our, our hearts go out to you on this occasion. I want to assure you that we will do our best to ensure that this, this does, does not happen. But I also agree with you that we need to manage these relations. Our approach in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is to manage, is to engage, you know, South Africa. Uh, we do not think is a question of uh, thinking of retaliation uh, at this stage because, as the caller from Akoibam said, that will undermine the spirit of African solidarity and unity. And our role as diplomat is to manage and build and cultivate relations, not to damage them. And when there are crises, our training is to ensure that we, we resolve those crises through engagement, through negotiations. That's the essence of diplomacy. That's what we are paid to do. And I want to assure Nigeria we do just that on this particular occasion. I thank right. you. We have yeah. another caller still yeah. from Akwaibom, Wana. Hello, go ahead. Hello, is the caller on the line? Hello, good evening. Yes, good evening. Go ahead. Hello, good evening. Good evening, go right ahead. Hello. Hello, go good ahead. Good evening, I'm Wana from Akwaibom. Yes, go on. Um, I don't have much to say 
what I just want to say. Yeah. And the South African, the South African, they don't really need us. So the South African, they don't need us. So it is high time Nigerians come back home. Let's come back home and develop Nigeria. Let's leave the South African village. They don't really want us. Their economy is growing while our own is dying. So I think Nigerian over there should come back home. That's my opinion. Right. <laughs> what? Well, there are still questions about that. Uh, your view, um, especially talking in terms of the economy, <laughs> if you recall, <laughs> Nigeria has been, Nigeria's economy has been put as the largest in Africa. And I in fact, even after the recession, it's, uh, it seems to have bounced back. So, <laughs> so the question, but well, uh, yeah, <laughs> let's well, hear you. Uh, well, uh, well uh, I like your straight to the point <laughs> <laughs> contribution. But those who have been but and I agree with you to an extent, really. There's no point taking a whole lot of rubbish where you can do better in your country. But we'll talk about that. But the issue of education. We've been saying, oh, they need to be educated. In fact, there was a time we said, Nigeria can send them teachers, as long as they're going to pay for the teachers, to teach them history. But I don't think this guy doing this um, Afrophobic attacks will even understand anything. That is the reality. And don't forget that it's also a small fraction of the South African population. So we've been talking about education, but how feasible that's going to be, I think it's just rhetorics. And we have to face that reality. But we will work at it. And they shot both the South African government. There must be people, the sense of people have been arrested. There must be people penalized for it. It is a crime. You don't just go around to people's houses and look, they attack, attack the house of a, a Nigerian married to a South African. The nine month baby is still in hospital. But, just, but the baby is getting better. So it's a crime against fellow brothers and sisters. So the South African government must be able to penalize some people. They also must be sincere about compensating those who have been genuinely um, uh, attacked while you know, diplomat diplomacy is going on. There are people who are in pains, uh, who are in ruins because of this. So they have to make a, they are the ones that will make a serious statement about, okay, there, there are immediate things you can do. We've talked about the voluntary work permits. We've talked about compensation. We've talked about, you know, ensuring that some people are penalized for this. If they don't do that, I'm, I'm afraid it's going to continue to happen. And yes, diplomacy is very important. You know, and at this point in time, South Africa and Nigeria are, you know, imagine a partnership between those two countries will take over the world. So these are destructions that both countries do not need within the continent. But South Africa must rise up today and make genuine show us genuinely that they want to tackle this matter. And I still insist that the African Union has a role to play in this regard. It's about Africa against Africa. The African Union at this point should be able to back and bite. African Union should speak out, speak up, and say something concrete about this. Because it portends a great danger for the African continent if this is not nipped in the pot. One more right, you will have to say uh, some other countries are driving you out of their country. So really, I think uh, even the African Union should take a more active role in this matter. All right, we have another caller, Aliu, calling in from Abuja here. Hello, Aliu. <coughs> Hello, Aliu. Hello. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yes. On this discussion. Yes. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. We can, can hear you. Me? We can hear you. Go Hello? ahead. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Ali. We can hear you. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, uh, my, my dear regards to the panel on this uh, uh, national discussion. Uh, indeed, uh, there must be something, you know, there will not be something that causes this uh, on unforeseen circumstances. Um, very fully well about uh, what we in Nigeria are. Sometimes uh, we do go out of our level uh, to do certain things that uh, maybe may be uncalled for. Uh, however, uh, due to those who don't know how uh, South Africa comes to 
to get uh, their sovereignty uh, on uh, the government that uh, has been on appetite, which Nigeria has been one of the major contributors. Uh, this has been, if it is question of Nigeria doing well in South Africa, really uh, considering the investment of South Africa in Nigeria, which is uh, indeed uh, uh, more than 200 percent compared to uh, what our Nigerians are in South Africa. However, on this regard, I think the best thing solutions on this uh, avenue is to educate our Nigerian, the, the Minister of Foreign uh, uh, Asia or uh, the advisor of the President on, on, on diaspora, uh, has a lot to do in this regard. Uh, some kinds of educational uh, uh, activities has to be uh, emphasized in a way that uh, the South Africa should know Nigeria and South Africa are the two uh, black power that uh, we have to, in fact, salvage from the uh, so-called colonial master, which we have already takes to make our country great, rather than be divided. So, however, there must be uh, a kind of uh, 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 awareness that uh, the, the, the special advisor on, on diaspora has to do to the South Africa of which, again, to educate Nigerian residing there, that anybody that does something out of his way, of course, even if South Africa has taken action, coming back to Nigeria must take action. This is what I can need to advise on this uh, uh, noble aspect. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Aliu. Well, thank you. All right, at this point in time, we'll take a short break and uh, we'll return in a while and we'll consider other issues. Um, Nigerians are calling for stronger measures. We'll examine a few of those measures that many Nigerians are calling for in order to press home, drive home the point to the South Africans that this country is not going to be sitting back and watching this happen. Stay with us on NTA Tuesday Live. We'll be back. <laughs> Nigerians, our fearless officers and men of the Nigerian military are winning the war against Boko Haram. Today, all occupied territories have been recovered and Boko Haram has been degraded. Our affected brothers and sisters are getting their lives back. However, they are now after you and me. In our mosques, churches, schools, motor parks, markets, entertainment centers, and public gatherings. Be vigilant. Be security conscious. Report suspicious persons, objects, and movements to the police and other security agencies. The security of our nation is a duty for you and me. Nigeria unite against terrorism. This message is brought to you by the Federal Minister of Information and Culture. The struggle for independence had been a long and tough one. Our founding fathers and compatriots sacrificed their comfort and even shed their blood. We cannot at this point in history afford to spirit away their sacrifices for immediate but temporary gains of today. Let us emphasize what unites and not what divides us. Working for the unity of purpose with a stronger vision for a better tomorrow. NTA, growing with the nation. Nigeria, the only country we can train with remarkable potentials to excel. Let us believe in ourselves and change our attitude for the sake of our country and generations unborn. Let us revive our cultural values, which are our essence as a nation. Let us renew the spirit of patriotism and hope in our dear country. Do not take or give bribe. Be punctual always. No more African time. We can't expect to be global citizens and operate on African time. Join the queue. Insist that people are attended to on a first-come basis no matter who they are or where they come from. Nigeria, good people, great nation. 
Tapeo, make you report any crooked person, object or worker jube movement to police and security agent demo. The security of our nation now work for all of us, so, plus including me and you. Nigeria, make we unite against terrorism. Na Federal Minister of Information and Culture, bring on this message. <laughs> Network Issue Oriented Innovation Talk Show. Thanks for staying with us. The issue tonight is the recurring attacks on Nigerians in South Africa. And uh, during the break, we we're joined by uh, Dr. Paddy Njoku, um, very regular uh, uh, face on this program. Dr. Paddy Njoku, thanks for being with us. Thank of you, course, sir. We know a lot Nigerians. about Dr. Paddy Njoku. His activities in peace building as a dean of uh, the National Association of uh, Peace Ambassadors and uh, uh, the Initiative for African Peace. So welcome once again. Thank you very this much. This is it. Um, well, it's been happening and Nigerians feel it's, uh, it's got to stop. Attacks on Nigerians in South Africa has been called uh, Afrophobia, uh, you know, xenophobic attacks and uh, so many reasons have been adduced for this and Nigerians are saying this is a country that Nigeria contributed a lot to liberate and this is what Nigeria gets back others have said diplomacy is the way to go to build a togetherness in the African continent but uh, again there are other Nigerians who say look diplomacy yes but you have to come down hard sometimes because Nigeria first before any other country, Dr. Joku. Well, I, I want to situate the problem actually where it belongs. This is um, an anti-apartheid apartheid. There was apartheid and the South Africans believed that at the end of apartheid, it will be Uhuru. At the end of apartheid, something happened. The whites were not asked to go away. They stayed. And of course, cornered the economy. I have been there myself. I've asked the authorities in South Africa, why is it that after apartheid is supposed to have gone, the economy is still within the grips of the whites in South Africa? They told me, they didn't want to make the mistakes that were made in, in um, Zimbabwe. So, the next thing that happened is that, okay, apartheid is gone. There is influx of other Africans into South Africa. And of course, Nigeria being what uh, she is in South Africa, we have the largest population of immigrants immigrants, black immigrants in South Africa. What is happening now is that after waiting for so many years, the people are not getting the dividends of the post-apartheid regime. They are now turning back to say, who is really taking up our places? What, what happens, you know, the people there by their very nature are a bit relaxed. If you go to a construction site and you get an, an Af I mean, an, a South African, you, you give him a price, he says, no, a Nigerian goes there to do the work. So they feel deprived. Secondly, there's an underlying factor that nobody talks about. Uh, the typical South African, if at a certain age you are not married, it is believed culturally that you are not able to produce children and regenerate your ancestors. So they feel that there is a retardation, an ancestral retardation, and they ascribe 
to Nigerians the cause of their retardation. They say, because they've taken our jobs, because they're now involved in hawking, they also take our women. I'm telling you the underlying factors, because if you want to treat any disease, you must get down to the real causes. They also take our women. We can't marry. We can't get them. We can't, we can't get jobs. And so they developed a, 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 an expression for them. They call they called Nigerians and other African immigrants there makwere kwere. It's a very derogatory appellation they use for these are people. And so when we are saying that, look, we'll help you get rid of appetite, they say, too bad. The people you helped are dead. It's not this generation now. So it's, it's a very complicated matter. But Nigeria must stand up to its responsibility. If you scratch a Christian head, you see the pagan in him. That same vigor, that same zeal with which we joined them to liberate the country and make themselves independent is the same vigor with which we, are, we have to liberate our own people there who have been held hostage. There is reciprocity in diplomacy. As you said, I'm a peace ambassador, but peace must have its tenets. My liberty stops where your own starts. We cannot, as a nation, accept that in this African continent we will be treated with the type of shabbiness we don't even receive in Europe or in any other continent. I think it's high time, because this one has been dragging for years and is developing more and more. The more they feel dispossessed economically, the South Africans, the more rabid, especially the blacks, they get against other Africans, and especially Nigerians, because of the typical Nigerian char character of dynamism, which we cannot change overnight anyway. Right. So the worry about the Nigerians being hardworking, being industrious, the worry about Nigerian businesses flourishing. Sure. But then South African businesses are flourishing in this country. Because we are xenophiliacs. In Nigeria, you practice xenophilia. They, they practice xenophobia. We love foreigners. If there's any, and it's right to our villages. If we, we see strangers and we start dancing and we receive them with, with open arms, culturally, that's how we are. That is why, I mean, if you tell them, oh, this company is South African, or they say, in Nigeria, provided this, provide, providing the services, they don't care. And of course, Nigerians, like I said, are large hearted. So we are a target of, I mean, displaced aggression. They are saying, you say we are free, we are independent, we've um, gotten rid of apartheid. We are still not free in our land. And who is now the next target of their loss of freedom is the black Africans and Nigerians being the most populous there become the primary target. Ambassador uh, uh, Thank you, sir. I, I want to agree yeah, with Dr. Njoku with those analysis, which actually resonate with me, and that's some of the things uh, that we said just before you came in. But let me just comment on a couple of points that I've made. First of all, the caller from Mako Ibom spoke about Nigerians coming back home and leaving the country. The fact of the matter is migration is a fact of life sure. and a fact of history. Even if the, green, the grass were to be green on this side of the divide, Nigerians, people will move. It's been a part of history, and a number of countries well, have been uh, created and produced out of migration. So even if economic prosperity in Nigeria were to be at the highest level, Nigerians will move. What we're saying is Nigerians should move out of their own choice to relocate from one part of the world to the other, and that they should also you know, feel free to, to do so on, 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 on a combat. So migration is a fact of life. We should not uh, criminalize uh, migrants anywhere they are. They contribute to the local community just as they do to their countries of origin. And then talking about education, I think what we say here is the need to raise awareness. Awareness 
is not synonymous as such with education. Awareness among the ordinary people about the role that we played in the anti-apartheid struggle is key. And from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we are looking at Nigeria's elements of soft power, which we have in abundance. And I will identify five elements of this soft power that is in abundance. You have Nigerian Nollywood that is very popular in South Africa. You have Nigerian churches, religious organizations, equally very popular in South Africa. Nigerian music is very popular in South Africa. Even our own culinary traditions and sartorial traditions are becoming to gain an ascendancy in other parts of Africa. I think these are latent soft power elements that we need to, to, to put to use to raise awareness, get Nollywood actors to you know, come up with films and, uh, and drama you know, scenes that would depict you know, this positive narrative about our country and remind ordinary South Africans down there, even among uh, South Africans in the Vero Township, to know that, oh, Nigeria is not an adversary. Uh, it's not an adversary of your country. They have been very supportive in your hours of meet, and therefore there's a lot of uh, prospects, great prospect for collaboration and partnership between our two countries as we seek uh, leadership of Africa. I think that's something we need to do more you know, along those, uh, in terms of raising the uh, the recent awareness. Then the reference to the African Union, yes, there's a chance that this could happen. But again, there are procedural. We are diplomats. We have to follow. There are procedural issues. You don't just go to the African Union summit and begin to say, oh, these are matters that, uh, yeah, within the rubric of general hate crimes, xenophobia, this can be raised. So what we're trying to do is to get our missions in Addis Ababa to have this uh, list for discussion first within the Permanent Representative Council, which is at the level of ambassadors, in Addis, and see how other Africans, again, you have to consult. You know, we need to consult Nigerians to get uh, a, a consensus around your own poli foreign policy initiative. Does it need to consult with fellow African countries who are also at the receiving end of what's going on in South Africa? It's not something we believe we can do alone. Of course, we have the means to do it, but, but in terms of sustainability and to be sure that there's a buy-in, there's a need for us to seek some consensus around these issues. That way we can be sure we'll get South Africans to listen to us uh, a, a lot more, I think. Some yeah. Nigerians have suggested that, well, since uh, they're sending Nigerians packing from South Africa, we should send South Africans packing from Nigeria. What do you say to that? <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> I mean, we, we're, we're not going to go down low. That's not who we are as a people. That's not who we are as a people. We're not going to go down low. But I'll take it from first from the African Union perspective. I think what uh, the Permanent Secretary has said is actually that a process has to begin. And that's what we're saying. And the process begins with this. And when you start the process, we need to follow it through. Yes, you're not just going to wake up today and say, but let's start by listing it as a major factor, starting with the permanent uh, body and all that. But it has to come to the table because it's going to happen again if we don't do something drastic. So I agree with that, but let the process begin. And we have started by saying you must intervene. Because a lot of people tell us that African Union will only just talk anyway. So let African Union show that African Union can do more than that. So let the process begin. And Nigeria needs to initiate the process. Because we're not the only ones, but this particular one has affected more of our people. Last year, it was more of Zambuans and Zimbabweans. So they, they could move tomorrow, it could be Somalians. <laughs> but this time around, they, so the issue of the Africa, then the issue of the awareness, absolutely. Absolutely. And even, you know, but, and even the issue of the awareness thing, the multinationals, the MTN, the Shaw Press, and the DSA should get more involved. They could also be part of the awareness campaign in South Africa. And then the issue of migration. I think we've said it several. You can't stop migration regular or irregular. You can reduce irregular migration. And we've said, like the Comptroller General said, don't call them illegal migrants. Mm -hmm. They are just irregular mm -hmm. migrants. Mm -hmm. What South Africa is doing now is that they are refusing to regularize those that can become regular migrants. And it's, it's, it's going to get worse if we continue not to at least say, do something immediate and something that will let them know that we're serious about this and uh, we're not going to take this line low anymore. Right. Back to the phones. We have uh, Mohammed calling in from Kaduna. Mohammed calling in from Kaduna. Hello, Mohammed. Are you there? Yes. 
Uh, good evening, sir. Yes, good evening. Go ahead. Good evening, Mr. Chief. Yes, go ahead. Good evening. Hello, good evening. Yes, go ahead. Good Hello. Evening. We can hear you. Uh, patriot, uh, patriotism kept all of us awake. Hello, I say patriotism kept all of us awake to this time. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Yes, go ahead. Mohammed, we're waiting. And uh, what I just want to add here is that uh, the Nigerian government needs to really step up. Uh, action uh, uh, about the. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that the Nigerian government needs to take more action. If this is the seventh xenoph uh, xenophobic attack we are having, why should we be waiting? On to when they, when, on to, on to when they uh, attack us more. So we just need to do more, not just uh, what the ambassador is saying. Uh, Our is saying that uh, they need to, as diplomats, they need to uh, go, uh, you know, go through diplomacy. Let us take more action so that we pass a very good message to them. If it's about even destroying the MTN lines, we can do that. Please let a very good message be passed to them. We cannot continue to be condoning this type of evil. It's evil. Thank you very much, sir. All right. Thank you, Mohammed. Well, Dr. Padinjoku, you heard us. <laughs> then let, let's, let's tie that last comment with another one which is coming. And yes. uh, they said, look, there are countries in the world today, without mentioning names, if you harm one of their citizens, they're not going to waste too much time talking to you about it. They'll swing into action That's without true. mentioning names. That's so true. Why can Nigeria not be like that? That's on, on the one hand. Yes. And, uh, Someone sent a message, and he's referring to, well, on the other side, he said, look, uh, there is a song that says, um, sometimes you don't have to fight to be a man. But the same song later on says, sometimes <laughs> you have to fight when you're a man. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, um, I, I think we should take all those in context. Um, it is interesting that uh, something happened, I think a year ago, two years ago, when MTN, for example, was found to have violated the laws of Nigeria. And a heavy fine was imposed on them. Their government came mm -hmm. vehemently behind them. And, and they got the soft landing. And they got, got the soft landing. Mm -hmm. And I think the principles of reciprocity should apply that if we could treat a foreign corporate organization that violated our laws with such kid gloves our own people whether they are physical or corporate there should be treated with kid gloves it is it is basic but as um, the pansex said in normal in normal modern diplomacy you don't just go directly for an eye for an, an, an eye for an eye. Absolutely. Otherwise, the United Nations will be full of one-eyed men. And we also will be blind. Where are the international? <laughs> where are all these tenets of international <laughs> diplomacy and modern diplomacy <laughs> yes. when your citizens are being yes. treated? You mentioned way. something interesting that there are some countries who you dare not touch their their citizens. Mm -hmm. Uh, mind you, in those contexts too, they they are mostly with people with whom they don't share any common um, diplomatic ties. Who they are supposed to be in a, a, a semi a semi permanent state of war. Mm -hmm. uh, so if um, you touch one of their citizens, it's it's, it's war instantly, and they retaliate immediately. So it, that's why I say it's a, it's a delicate thing. We have the inalienable right to migrate to any part of the world, not to talk of the African continent. And nobody can deny us that. Nobody can also deny a South African here. But that right must be respected in all nations of the African Union. I mean, it's, it's, it's funny that when Europe, for example, is trying to fuse into one country, when Europe can give us 
a Schengen visa. And just one visa takes you to as many countries as, as possible. Then we in this continent are saying, no, you must not enter our country when you are an African. So I think that um, diplomacy has to be followed, but it has to be muscled diplomacy. All right. Let's go back to the phones. We have uh, Sunday calling in from Lagos. Hello, Sunday. Oh, well, so I understand that Sunday is calling from Abuja, not Lagos. Sunday in Abuja, hello. Hello. Hello, go ahead, right. Uh, Sunday, not Sunday, Sunday. Oh, Sunday. All right, you stand corrected. Thanks. Uh, what I'm saying is most of us were students in the late 70s and 80s. We were made compelled to pay for our mega allowances for the liberation of South Africa. Dr. Fabi Njoku was my, my, my mate at the University of Ibada. That's true. Mm -hmm. That time, if you can recall, yes. we were made to pay some, some America allowances to pay for the liberation of these people. I'm surprised that these people that we paid as students to liberate them are the ones that are fighting against us today. And the government is treating them with kid gloves. We should let them know that we contributed for their liberation. And we are supposed to be their brothers, elder brothers for that matter. And the government, if the government is not doing anything, I think our own government should have to recall our ambassador, our high commissioner from there to let them know that we know what they're doing and we know what we are doing but have chosen to be a fool for the sake of peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Ambassador Nicola, you heard the man. Thank you very much, uh, Cyril and Nigeria. Let me also agree again with Dr. Njoku with those remarks I made about the need for a very robust diplomacy, what you yes. call muscle diplomacy. Yes. We're taking note of those uh, comments and we will, uh, of course, we'll reflect on those and uh, and put them across to our principal. We've taken note of all the positive remarks and recommendations. And that's the essence of this uh, interaction, in my view. But in terms of uh, Nigeria's role in the liberation struggle, we've spoken about that and the need, therefore, to raise awareness. But let me just make a general point of, uh, of application in other African countries. It is often said that because of the role we played in, in, in Southern Africa, another part of Africa, we need to derive greater benefits for Nigerians in terms of those uh, arising from those foreign policy exertions. And Nigeria wants these uh, benefits to count in Naira and Kobo. But I'd like to say here that Nigerians also forget that a peaceful and prosperous Africa has a lot of, uh, you know, potential to advance Nigeria's own economic interests. If you travel to many African countries today, Nigerian businesses are thriving in many of those countries. If you go to, into the spare part market in several Central and East African countries, they are dominated by Nigerians. I mean, if there is no peace in those countries, those guys cannot. And I don't want to mention, you know, the expansion of Nigerian banks into many countries in Africa and some big con conglomerates like Dangote that are also doing well. We need to have more Dangotes so, so that they can leverage on the kind of... Uh, exertions and investment that Nigeria has made in foreign policy in the last 50 years. I think we should begin to look at the benefit of Nigerian foreign policy exertions in terms of those, you know, benefit that Nigerians, including ordinary Nigerians, are deriving from. That is the kind of thing we want to see happen in South Africa. It may not have been, it's not happening yet. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. We'll resolve. The, for us, this is a passing phase. We believe that this irritants, as we call them in diplomacy, they will pass, and thank God no life has been lost. We're not going to wait for Nigerians to be killed. We will continue to, you know, upscale our level of engagement with South Africa. 
and believe they will uh, cooperate with us on this on this matter. I think. All right. You, you said earlier on that there is a procedure mm -hmm. um, uh, in diplomacy. Mm -hmm. The last caller suggested uh, um, recalling uh, Nigeria's uh, High Commissioner for consultations. You, you don't think we've reached yes. that stage? Uh, no, I don't think. I'm in touch with our envoys, Ambassador Martin Coburn is my acting High Commissioner in Pretoria. And we have uh, uh, Ambassador Julio Keke and her deputy also in Jobok. We're in touch with them on a regular basis. They report to I want. I like to say that when this first broke on a Sunday, I called them and I said, please, I need a report from you before the end of the day on a Sunday. And they did just that. So really, we do not think we need to recall our embers at this stage because they are doing a great job. Ambassador Kobam had been in the news, he's met, he's visited the scenes of these uh, destruction is met uh, Nigerian community leaders, you know, he's engaged with them on a daily basis. Apart from going out to meet them, he's invited them to the High Commission and they're in touch. In addition to that, he has uh, established dedicated telephone lines, about six, seven, ten of them, which are made available to Nigeria and South Africa. Please call these numbers in the event of uh, any signal that you might pick up that uh, has potential to, to degenerate. Uh, Okay. So we think it's really an excellent job, and therefore, in our view, there's no need yet to, to ask him to come home. Okay, we go over to Zamfara. We have uh, Manir calling in from Zamfara. Hello, Manir. Hello. You know, one thing, we cannot forget the teaching of the history. Because Nigerian government contributes a lot to see South Africans, their happiness and freedom. But now this is the result we have. Thank you. That's all, Manir. It's a comment. <laughs> well, <laughs> straight to it. <laughs> <laughs> that was all Manir had to say. We did a lot. And, uh, well, with this in mind, Nigerians are also asking the question that what is it that we have derived from the support to not just South Africa, but so many other African countries where Nigeria has played the role of big brother? What are we deriving from these countries? What are we getting from South Africa? <laughs> I exactly. Yes, well, well, okay. yes, anyone yeah, can take that. Yeah. Well, well, okay. Um, I already spoke about this. Yes. In terms of uh, the benefit we are deriving from, you know, our previous uh, exertions in foreign policy in Africa, uh, we don't have the figures, but the truth of the matter, I'd identified two, three categories of Nigerians that are doing very well. Right, but some Nigerian businesses, they... Nigerian insurance companies, yes. and, and they are doing well. We need to empower, we need to reach out more. Yes, Nigerians because say, this is, uh, uh, sorry? Yes, Nigerians say, look, yes, uh, they do business, there's peace in those countries, that's why they can travel there and do business. So sometimes when it comes to supporting Nigeria and international bodies, these countries turn their backs. Uh, I'm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind, yes, I, I've, lived, so. I've lived in francophone countries. Right. Yes, um, there is a linguistic factor. Mm. And that's part of what is causing this problem. Mm. Nigeria, for example, is surrounded by four <laughs> francophone countries. We don't have an anglophone neighbor. Mm -hmm. And between here, and South Africa. It's only when you start getting to Namibia, for example, that you get somebody with whom you are in the same linguistic kindred. Mm. And so that place where Nigerians can get in and start speaking and somebody understands them Im Im immediately, they flock down there. It is natural. But as the Pemsek said, it may interest you that from here to Angola, the motor spare parts business is almost monopolized by Nigerians. Now, I told you I've lived in Francophone countries. Having lived there and having studied the policy of assimilation that the French government practiced for years, I now appreciated why they colonized 
those areas. You have to acquire their taste, eat their cheese, drink their champagne, eat their type of bread, and so your economy is almost directly tied to their own, to the, to the ones of the colonialists. Now, in the case of Nigeria, we go into a place, give our help, and of course pull out. The businesses the Pentec is talking about are mega businesses, the Dangotes and so on and so forth. But the, these other colonialists and neo-colonialists have a soft, software business of getting into the very lives of the people that they become indispensable okay. to them, which we haven't no. yet achieved. All right. And just, let, uh, let okay. me just, okay, let me just take this call from Lagos. Ulu Yori, and then we'll come to you. Ulu Yori calling in from Lagos. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. How are you, sir? Yes, just go ahead. Yeah, I am watching this program, and I discover that uh, even the political head of South Africa do not appreciate the contribution to the liberation of South Africa by Nigerians. I believe economically today South Africans are benefiting too much than all the minor, minor businesses Nigerians are doing there. So if we are going to South Africa to Nigeria, we must put everything on paper. This is the volume of the businesses from South Africa. Please show us what Nigerians are doing here. And compare the notes. And now educate your people. Otherwise, I don't know what we are doing there. What we are going there for? Where is diplomacy? You killing our people? You are enjoying all our all the benefits on this side, and we cannot even stand up to help to help our people. It is annoying. This cannot be allowed to continue. Thank you. Good night. Right. Thank you very much, Yes, you were going to. Well, uh, what, 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 Mr. Leary, thanks for your comments. And I think that's what we've been saying here, that yes, there will be diplomacy, which is very important, but there must be immediate steps now. And it has to be on the part of South Africa. You must show us that you're serious about tackling this thing. It's going to get worse. 97 Nigerians were deported yesterday from South Africa. Yes, three of them were drug-related. They've served their sentences. Three were women. The rest were irregular migrants. They've been raiding them. You don't have your papers, go to your country. And they're making it difficult to have those uh, um, work permits. Like I said here, they've um, stopped the voluntary work permit they were giving to Africans. These are important things. There are steps that must be taken now. That hopefully, while the diplomacy goes on, and then the issue of awareness is not going to happen in a day. We have to continue. And like I said, MTN, ShopRite should get involved in the awareness campaign. They can use our Hollywood too. To gather. But it's a long-term thing. But there has to be immediate solutions. We don't have to wait for more people to die, as we've heard. But going back to um, the issue of uh, we, we said before, I want to commend in particular. You know, this, I saw the strength in being Nigerian. It didn't matter where they came from. Igbo, Hausa, Yoruba, they got together, spoke to one another, You know, came together as a community, sent information out. Don't go to this area. And I think that is commendable. Again, the mission in... South Africa, give our phone numbers, open the doors, you have a crisis, come here. And I saw the, the camaraderie, the, the beauty of being Nigerian in this crisis. There was no, you're, you're here from there, they all got together and protected one another. And don't forget, when on Friday, the South Africa got a permit to go on a demonstration, they gave them the permit, but the mission had met the whole day with the South African police authority and exerted a commitment that they will protect Africans, and they did. And I saw that for the first time, actually, driving them in with tear gas. And then when they saw that the foreigners were armed to defend themselves, they retreated. We don't want to see more of that happen, but I'm saying that 
we, we are going to continue diplomacy and all that, but there must be immediate steps that must be taken to show that the political will is there. Otherwise, it's going to get worse. You still don't believe in tit for tat? No, 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 no tit for tat. Right. I, 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 well, Mr. The peace man can so come in. I don't think it's tit for tat Thank now. You. No, no, no tit for tat. But make some demands. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> and these demands would be now. Now some are saying, okay, now we'll take a, 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 you know, a hard stance and say, look, there must be compensation. And people have said, we should not forget two years ago. So even if you're talking of compensation now, we must tie it with that of two years ago because uh, people lost their lives. Sure. It's been happening. Um, before I talk about that, uh, I see that Nigerians are very bitter about the contributions we made, which seem not to be appreciated at all. Oh, and okay. it is natural. Okay. Let, let, hmm? let me just ask you to just hold yes. on a while. Uh, yes. Let's go to Lagos. Uh, there's a caller from Lagos. Uh, just introduce yourself quickly and uh, make that comment or question. Hello, good evening. Yes, good evening. Um, I want to appreciate everybody in the studio. And um, I think um, I, I, I sincerely want to appreciate our Honorable Abike Dabiri, because she has actually been doing a lot ever since this crisis started. Um, I have a friend in South Africa, and I had the palm sake say that um, no life has been lost. He told me categorically, he's married to a South African, he lives in Pretoria. He told me that some people have been killed. So I think we, should, we need to confirm that information again. And again, I want to uh, agree with um, Dr. Induku that there must be reciprocity in diplomacy. You see, you don't just deport Nigerians, you don't just take love into your hand. The policemen are just not protecting our people the way they ought to protect them. You don't do that thing in Nigeria. Even uh, as Dr. Induku actually said, we welcome visitors a lot. You cannot just push a visitor away here in Nigeria. The police, the authorities will not allow you to do that. They will, they will treat it as a very criminal offense. And to the extent that um, Nigerians are taking their jobs, we have people from Kutonu, the Republic, we have people from Togo, we have people from Ghana. I work in construction. They come, if, you, if, they, if they give you a job, if you don't want to do it, they come and do it for a lesser amount, and nobody is attacking them. So that, is not, that should not be an excuse for them to be attacking our citizens. I think we need to reciprocate this yes, sure. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Right, Ambassador. Yes. Um, the issue of the contributions Nigeria made mm. to liberate some of these countries, you know, help, help them stabilize. Uh, Nigerians are, are, are very bitter about it. We have problems, mm. internal problems. Our people are suffering here. But whenever they are sending problems, you saw what happened in Gambia they, 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 how many weeks ago. Our people moved. Like, the big brother will play a role. The next day, the nationals turn around as if, I mean, to victimize us for our good deeds. I think, uh, Mr. Pamsek, sir, this has to be taken up seriously. We don't just go um, like, like uh, Father Christmas. We need stability, quite all right. We need continental peace, quite all right. But we shouldn't be taken for granted as a nation. Otherwise, Nigerians will start taking their own leaders and their government for granted. So Nigerians need to be protected. Cyril said here that there are countries where it is an eye for an eye. But we say we don't want to go for that. But then, a Nigerian should feel proud carrying that passport, especially on this continent. Um, as Honorable said, I lived in Cameroon. I won't <laughs> mention the millions of Nigerians who are there. We had an understanding with Cameroon that you could come in just with your passport and stay for 90 days without a residence permit. It's after the 90 days that you start now organizing for a residence permit. And of course, such a provision could be abused either way. But Nigerian diplomacy helped to soften <coughs> the, well, gendarme mentality of, of uh, some of these people. They say, no, no, you have overstayed that one day, you must go. Some of us used to go in and say, sorry, 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 you know, we are brothers. We share such a long border, and we cannot be treating our people like that. So I think more effort has to be put in along that line to let these people know that we are, we are, we are, there's something that binds us, apart from the normal 
diplomacy. Mm. We are this, from this continent. You cannot go to Europe and have more liberty than, than you can have on your own soil. So the, uh, the uh, audiences of the AU, the African Union, have to look into this. But I must also tell you that Nigeria is looked upon with envy and, if you like, some measure of dislike. Mm -hmm. That is why you were saying that, uh, you know, you go there, you go for a conference or something, there's a post that comes out. By the time the Francophones gather together, they make sure that, oh, if Cyril Stover is, uh, is Nigerian, mm -hmm. he's Anglophone, <laughs> they will not get it. And they vote. Once they vote, they outnumber us. Mm -hmm. this, this is a reality. It happens every day. But I think it's also material for more work. Now, how much of this can we, you know, um, uh, put down to profiling? Because it would seem that all over the world, and this is not restricted to South Africa alone, there is some form of profiling of Nigerians everywhere they go. Now, there are countries where their nationals are not viewed with the same level of uh, suspicion and disdain. What's it in our makeup that drives other countries? to this level of profiling of Nigerians? What would you say? Uh, uh, um, thank you, sir. Before I respond to that particular question, let me just make a couple of comments on some of the points that have been, have been made. I think Nigerians need to take pride in their country for the kind of values that uh, our forefathers bequeathed on us at independence. I recall a statement made by the first prime minister. He said on one occasion, that when we give aid and assistance to African, fellow African countries, we should not expect anything in return. I know Nigerians now will be alarmed to, to hear that. Give because we believe we have to give. And I mean, I'll give a, a, an example. If somebody comes to your house for lunch every day, and the next thing you do is to tell another neighbor, oh, I'm expecting Shola is going to come for, for, for lunch, and that neighbor gets to know that you've already told a third party, what do you think in Nigeria he would do? He would not come. He would rather go hungry. And he would not. So I don't think this constant reminder, much as we appreciate how this, where this is coming from and the reason, I don't think it's very helpful. You know, we should just believe in what we believe we should do. We should uphold some noble values, which in our view enables us. That's what makes us different. I don't want to talk about Nigerian exceptionalism, but that's the fact. That's why we're different. That's why we're not South Africa. That's why we're another country. We're Nigerians. And we don't think the time has come for us to abandon those uh, hallowed principles and values on the basis of which our foreign policy was founded and are still valid up to this day. Then in terms of profiling, yes, uh, we admit that we have uh, issues around profiling. There are challenges of image. And again, uh, like uh, a former president once said in one event in London, he said, most snakes, some snakes are not, are not dangerous. They're friendly. But because a few are dangerous, and when they buy, they kill, the natural instinct of every human being is when you see a snake, what do you do? You either run away or you try to kill it. When you look at the, the percentage of Nigerians that are involved in this, they are very, very small. Nigerians, the vast majority of Nigerians, all over the world, including South Africa, go to South African universities and see how many Nigerian professors you know, in the medical field, the Nigerians are the ones that hold those sectors in South Africa. It's the same all over the world, either in the UK, in the US. The Nigerians are doing an excellent job, and Honorable Abike Dabri will confirm that in her, in her work in the diaspora field. But there's this tiny Nigerians, and therefore, and then it's not unusual, too, that some Africans find it convenient, even when they're arrested. The next thing they say, oh, we're Nigerians. I think we also have to accept, much as we, we work and agree with the point you've made about the need for us to work harder in all of this, that's part of the burden of leadership that we need to, to take because we are the most populous country in Africa. That's true. When you arrest, uh, you know, 10 blacks in Africa, you know, the likelihood is that perhaps the majority of them will be Nigerian because that probably is a reflection of the share of the population on the continent. I think we need to manage this. We need to accept their reality and see how we then... With them. And then finally, the link between domestic uh, environment and foreign policy is key. We cannot ignore the mood out there 
All the callers have spoken about uh, lack of recognition, indeed acknowledgement of the role that we play. It will be full hardy on our part as uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs to ignore that there's a mood. But again, foreign policy is such that I don't want to call it an elitist enterprise. It is one in which you've got to aggregate the interests and views of your constituency and see how that factor into your national interest. And that's what we try to do in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. All right. Well, the there. issue of profiling, let me talk about the issue of profiling. I'm glad you brought that. We're only talking about this because it has to be South Africa. Yes. And, you know, everywhere I go, I'm so proud to be in Nigeria. <coughs> That's the beauty of it. Just today, a Nigerian student got again, uh, what's the university now? Somewhere in the, was it in the UK? Mm. Even in Sudan, a Nigerian orphan was the best medical student. Mm. In Ghana, at the same time, two Nigerian girls. So we could go on and on. That's why... I keep telling Nigerians we need to celebrate ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when we're talking of maybe how many Nigerians uh, in a particular country, if one Nigerian is in trouble, 10,000 are doing great things. Mm -hmm. Even as the, ambassador, um, the permanent secretary said, in South Africa, I've been there in a South African hospital where I just went with a patient, and the Nigerian doctor was not there, and they all refused to say, no, the doctor. Mm -hmm. Is that him or nobody? Mm -hmm. The same thing with the engineers. The same thing with the, with the people in the... Uh, universities and all that. But you know what? And I keep telling Nigerians that, you know, we always have to celebrate ourselves. And that's what we try to do. <coughs> Any, anywhere we go, anywhere Mr. President goes, I mean, we, we always showcase the best in us. And I remember him saying, you know, this, this even helps my temperament. And, you know, knowing that these are Nigerians and so good. So there's a challenge to all of us to focus more on the good than the bad. And even the South Africa we're talking about, the number of doctors there, mm -hmm. even if they decide to withdraw, will affect them. And the nurses. And there's no way Nigerians are not no. excelling. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a challenge to all of us. The international media will not do it for us. We have to do it ourselves. And one of the reasons why, in our own little way, we have a magazine where we always talk about the good in us and how we're doing so great things all over the world. And I think that is important, and we have to do uh, more in that regard. So thank you for talking about the profiling. We're just the best people in the world. Maybe that is why we get this envy yeah, and right. anger and that Nigerian swagger mm. ah, right. sometimes. Mm. Uh, yes, you can take it away. I'm very happy you brought right. up the issue of profiling. profiling. Mm. I get worried when we over-criticize mm. ourselves. Mm. In fact, as somebody I told that we behave like a man who is um, a father of so many girls. And then he puts a, a signpost on his door that, this house is full of prostitutes, and he expects people to come and marry his daughters. <laughs> eh? We can't be calling ourselves thieves and thieves and murderers and all this every day. The French people, you know how they introduce? Comment vous appelez-vous? Mm. He says, je m'appelle. Mm. Pardon, Joko. This, the, literal, the literal thing is, how do you call yourself? What do you call yourself? And I say, I call myself, je m'appelle. So you, you, you can't call me what I don't call myself. So I think we also, as a people, as a nation, should know that there are some domestic problems we have to handle domestically. We can't, we can't continue, you know, um, dry cleaning ourselves on top of the mountain every day and washing our dirty linens in public and expect others to have a contrary view, a view different from what we have given them. And so this issue of profiling is very, very important for our government, for our people, for our leaders. If you're, if, I mean, <coughs> the name you give, you give yourself is what they call you. Very important. Right. It's, it's of note that um, even when Nigerians have protested against uh, what's happening now, you could see that um, in all the places they went to, Nigerian official security agents were on hand okay. and they made sure that... Uh, things did not get out of hand. And uh, so, well, uh, not so much could be said of uh, the South African authorities when people were doing all this. And uh, somehow, uh, Nigerians got more incensed when they saw all kinds of footages showing authorities, people who were supposed to protect those under attack looking away while this was going on and uh, not putting in that much effort. But the situation in Nigeria is different. Do you think that's something Nigeria should celebrate too? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we should, uh, Sarah, we should celebrate that. In the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the last couple of days, we've received groups of protesters. 
And when information was brought to my attention that they're there, I said, go and meet them and talk to them. Because I was not available, I asked my senior officials, please engage these Nigerians. I mean, we have a freedom, free freedom of assembly of report. Once they are non-violent and they are peaceful, they have a right to express their views. And uh, even today, they came, and my, my officer go, went to the gate, received them, explained to them what we're doing, and to assure them the Nigerian government was on top of, of the situation. And they went away happily. Thereafter, we took their, their, their letters of protest, which we are now you know, processing to, to transmit to, to the president, to the presidency. That is the civil, talking about some of the things I said about our values, our tradition. That's the way we are. We cannot speak for other countries that don't behave the same way. But that's Nigeria. We cannot change whom we are for the good. I mean, the better part of us, the positive aspect of our life. That's what we need to do more to, to make this country truly great and respected on the continent. Right. As, as, as we wind down, although this is not directly um, tied to the South African situation, but we in, in, in the past, um, few weeks we have seen numbers of Nigerians coming back home from other countries and a number of them have spoken out and said well they went out there and like we, we always say east west home is best and they realize that um, it's better for them to come home where they still have a stake and uh, I do know that you have uh, received a number of um, uh, these Nigerians who have come back Yes, thank you. First, I'd like to, and I'm glad you answered that question. When people say oh, economy is bad, they are leaving. These people that are, that are coming, I didn't leave in the last one year or two years. They've left for some time, but it's getting tougher out there. And when they send distress calls through our missions and the calls coming, Mr. President has instructed that whenever any Nigerian in distress, do everything to get them back home. So Libya in particular, as you know, the case of Libya has been terrible. And again, there were distress calls, you know, phone calls, and the mission um, worked on that. And working with the IOM, NEMA, uh, brought, has brought back almost 1,000 from Libya. And the last one we did two days ago from Mali, these are trafficked girls, victims of human trafficking. 41 of them, young, pretty girls. <coughs> one as young as 16, victims of Libya. They've been stranded in Libya. And when we got in touch with the chief of um, defense staff and the Nigerian Air Force chief, they were... They willingly, immediately gave us a plane to bring them back. And those girls are at the shelter now. We profile them. And then we're working with states. Like a do state has said, when the citizens <coughs> come, so we have their names, their data. They will have skills um, acquisition programs for them. Like one girl yesterday said, she would do, she would, by the time she does my hair for me, <laughs> I would know myself again. I said, okay, I'm coming to get you. I hope it's not Libyan <laughs> yeah. hair. She goes, she goes, <laughs> <laughs> this one is from Mali. Okay, okay Mali. No, you know this, sir. Uh, and um, so under this administration, when there's a distress call, uh, as instructed by the president, just get them back in. And, you know, they came back. Some went on their knees thanking God that they're back. In the case of Libya, they're dead. The lucky ones are the ones coming back, and more will be evacuated. And we're also appealing to Nigerians that don't go to these places. Mm -hmm. You're better off at home, no matter, no matter how bad it is. Some people that came from Libya are just selling Richard cats, and the guy has been able to have another child, build a house, you know? So there are good stories coming out. And hopefully, well, as we get them back, mm -hmm. discourage them from going to these places if you are not sure of where you're going to and what you're going to meet there. Those girls yesterday were also thanking, and they know, they nap tip, never, they trace their families and return them back to where they're coming from. And then uh, there are also programs to give them some money to start their businesses and all that. So we'll continue to improve on that and hopefully we we'll save quite a lot of our Nigerians um, from this unnecessary and pathetic situation. Right, Dr. Padin Joko, in the context of that, well, I, I think we have a collective responsibility mm -hmm. to educate our younger ones that there is no free meal in free town. There's no El Dorado there where you get and, and, and everything well, is... I like eh? that. <laughs> you, 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 <laughs> like the analogy. No free meal in free town. In free town. town. <laughs> so don't, don't go, right. to, to, you know, crossing the desert because you want to get in Europe, I mean to Europe, and then cross the Mediterranean and so on and so forth. We've been there. We see that it is not, it's not <laughs> even as easy as it is here. Mm -hmm. Even the weather here, the weather alone is receptive enough, is hospitable enough, not to talk of when you go there. So please, we have, um, 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 we, um, Honorable, you don't wait till they get there. I think part of your job too is start sensitizing people, 
those states, we see that most of these migrants come from some particular states, most especially. Let them start educating the young ones Absolutely. here. That you talk, there is no heaven on earth out there. Life is even harder there. Those people don't, you go to a place where somebody prefers his or her dog to you, a human being. And our children want to go because of a sense of adventure, of a, a sense of uh, going to see something new. It is not possible. As, let me repeat, no free meal in Freetown. Free town. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. In a moment or two, but uh, your final word is to close uh, this program. Uh, thank you, thank you, sir. I want to agree fully with the point that has been made about the need to raise awareness yes. and education at the grassroots level, particularly some of the states where we find most of these uh, trafficking uh, originate from. That is key. We need to go back to the old of that popular uh, jingle on television, Andrew, checking Andrew, out checking the country. Out. Yes. We need to bring that back. <laughs> but let me also comment uh, on a substantive issue, which is the procedure for returns and returnees. <clears throat> In some of the countries where we have, uh, you know, MOU on the readmission and returns, we have a standard template that we have developed with the Nigerian Immigration Service. And that has five main elements. First, we need to be sure that the potential returnees are truly Nigerians. And that means we need to interview them, we need to check before we even give them, give them the, 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 the travel document. We don't want a situation where non-Nigerians are suddenly dumped on our shores and it happened. We make sure that, that that does not happen. Second, we have to satisfy ourselves that the missions that they have exhausted all local remedies. In the event that they've gone to court, in the event they've gone on appeal about their deportation order, we need to be sure that all of those appeals have been heard, you know, and perhaps failed. And therefore, they have no more remedy within, within the country. Thirdly, family ties. What kind of tie do they have? Do they have children? What are the rights of, of uh, you know, children? You don't want to bring them back and separate families? We ensure that does not happen. There are medical conditions. Are they medically fit to travel before you put them on a plane so that we don't have a situation in which they go and die. And finally, to be returned in a dignified, orderly manner. All right. That is our standard procedure. Okay, Can I just was, add here <coughs> that these returnees are voluntary returnees to okay. so separate so them from the deportees. The the these are people who have been there, have gone to the mission, and they want, they say want to return. Want to and then they come back voluntarily. All right. Mm. So that's our program. And as we round off, yes, uh, Ambassador Eniko Olai spoke about um, uh, sensitization jingles, which ran on NTA many years ago. I'd like to say that the NTA is still today <laughs> blazing that trail. And currently, even as we speak now, there are such jingles running on the network service of the NTA, sensitizing people that there's no need to go through all those means. Uh, trying to reach where you think uh, it's better. So on that note, we'd like to thank you for coming on this program. Um, thank you. Thank you we appreciate you coming on this program to discuss the matter. And uh, let's say a big thank you to the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ambassador Shola Enikon uh, Lai. We thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you very much. And, uh, well, of course, it's always a delight to have you here, uh, the Senior Special Assistant to the President on uh, Foreign Matters and uh, the Diaspora. We appreciate your being here. Thank Abhikar you. Thank you for Thank being you. here. And uh, also, Dr. Padin Joku, who's always part of us here, and uh, I did say I would refer to <laughs> no free <laughs> food or free, <laughs> no free, 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 free town. <laughs> but again, <laughs> but again, it's also in free town that they say, good me do, thank you, me no get. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And so thank you also for being part of this program. Next week we'll reach you again on NTA Tuesday Live. I'm Cyril Stober. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.